So here's a fluid. Let's say it's water. It's in this container, which is a beaker. Okay. And right on top here, we have atmospheric pressure. Yeah. So everywhere that it's open to the atmosphere, there's the same pressure, atmospheric pressure. If the pressure here was slightly different from there, there would be a flow from the high pressure to the low pressure air side. So let's say it's an equilibrium, then the pressures have to balance out. If we consider this block of fluid in here, so it's exactly the same fluid as that, just to make it, just to distinguish this volume here, we've shaded it slightly differently, but it's just the same fluid as that. If you consider the pressure at the top surface here, then let's say it's on pressure P1, okay? So force per unit area, what is the force? Force is pressure times the area, let's say this area, cross-sectional area is A. Yeah, and this, my force becomes P1A. And let's say on the lower side, I have a force P2A. Is there any other force acting on this block? Its weight is acting downwards, Mg. Yeah? So these three forces need to be balanced if the fluid is not in motion, if it's static and in equilibrium. That means P1A plus Mg is equal to P2A. Or if we write it in terms of forces, then in terms of pressure, then we have P2 equals P1 times rho GH, where I have just replaced M using its relationship with density. So we know rho equals mass per unit volume, or mass can be always replaced by rho times V. And what's, what's the volume of this? The volume of this is nothing but rho times A, cross-sectional area times the height, this height. So we get rho AH, and if we are writing this force Mg, then let me multiply my M by G. So I get a term of G everywhere. And I get rho GAH as my force and as the pressure, I don't need to multiply by the area, so I get rho GH as the pressure. So this is the pressure equation, equating the pressures. Yeah? Okay. So as you go deeper in the fluid, up here you have atmospheric pressure. Here you have pressure due to the atmosphere, plus pressure due to this much fluid. Down here, you have pressure due to the atmosphere plus this much fluid, much more, right? So now you should be able to understand why this, these two arrows are not the same length. You want to think about that. If I have a, a tube like this with several different openings and their bores are different. So this is a little wider than this. This is much wider. You see that the level of the fluid is the same in all of them. So all of these rise to the same level, which means the depth of the height is the same. And all of them are exposed to the atmosphere, which means they have atmospheric pressure. So it doesn't matter what shape your container is. Yeah? We define atmospheric pressure as one atmosphere or 1.03, sorry, 1.013 times 10 to the power of five pascals, okay? Pressure does not depend on the shape of the container, just depends on the height, okay? Pascal's principle states that a change in pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every point in the fluid and to the walls of a container be easier to understand with the diagram. Let's say I have this container and this yellow stuff is my fluid and I have a movable piston here and a piston there. Then if I apply a certain pressure here, that means I apply a force across this area, which is area A1, then that force is instantly transmitted to all parts of this fluid and, and to the walls of the container, these gray walls. That's Pascal's principle. So it's quite useful actually, we find this principle 
uh, can be used to create several devices like a hydraulic lift shown here. Here I have my container designed in such a way that one side, the cross-sectional area, is much lower than the other side. So you see A2 is much greater area than A1. And my aim is to lift this car. So if I need to lift the car, I need to provide a force which is at least equal to mg, the mass times the gravity for the car. Yeah? That's quite a lot of force. I'm trying to reduce the force that I need to apply, but still manage to lift the car. This hydraulic uh, lift is going to help me do that because my force per unit area, so F1 divided by A1, must be equal to F2 divided by A2. Okay. So that's what's written here, okay? And we know that F1 and A1 are both small. A2 is large, therefore F2 must be larger than F1. So automatically my force has become greater because of Pascal's principle. And now this force F2, you can look at its arrow size, much greater than F1. It, it can be sufficient to raise the car, although I didn't apply the force F2. I applied a much smaller force of F1. Yeah? So um, you might be given pressure in several different units. You need to understand the conversions between them. More commonly, we say that one atmosphere pressure can be given as one ATM, which is 76 centimeters of mercury or 760 millimeters of mercury. That's the height of the column of mercury. Same as 1.013 times 10 to the power 5 pascals. Same as 14.7 pounds per square inch. We'll tend to use this one uh, quite seldom. Mostly you will see pascals or atmospheres. Yeah? So one atmosphere of pressure is defined as the pressure equivalent to a column of mercury exactly 0 0.76 meters tall at 0 degrees Celsius where G is this value here, okay? You're gonna calculate that in this question. What depth of mercury creates a pressure of one atmosphere? To understand this question, you've been given this helpful diagram. Here's a tub of mercury and an inverted closed test tube. And this entire system is in equilibrium, so nothing is moving. Out here, we know that we must have one atmosphere pressure, right? So let's just write that, actually. That's right. On the surface, we have one atmosphere pressure. Same as this side, right? Because both are exposed to the atmosphere. Same as on, our, on us, on our bodies, we constantly have one atmosphere pressure. We are designed that way. So we don't sense it, okay? But we live with it constantly. Which means in here at the same height, we must have an atmosphere pressure. The pressure in here, vacuum creates no pressure. So the pressure is entirely due to this column of mercury, this height. And how much is that pressure? We saw in a previous slide that that pressure is gonna be given by rho GH, right? So we're being asked for what depth of mercury? We're being asked to find out this height here. So I'm going to solve for this. H equals pressure divided by rho times G. Symbols are looking quite similar. Don't get confused. This is the density. And in the numerator, we have pressure. Yeah? So you need to be careful that you're in the MKS SI units. So one, you're going to take the, unit, the value in Pascals for pressure. And the density of mercury is given here, you know, G. So you should be able to calculate that height. And then compare with what I got, which is 760 millimeters of mercury. This is the symbol for mercury, Hg, yeah? Now to our last but very important concept about fluids. And this came from Archimedes, who lived in BCE. So concepts developed in BCE are still being held true today. Yeah? What powerful understandings. He worked on the buoyant force, 
And that's what we're going to look at. Let's just read this first. An object completely or partially submerged in a fluid is buoyed up by a force whose magnitude is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. That means if I have this round object and I completely submerge it in a fluid, okay, that means it's none of it is floating above, it's entirely inside. Then the buoyant force that is felt by this, which is a pressure difference, okay, I'll explain that in a minute. But the buoyant force is an upward force experienced by this object due to the fluid that it's submerged in. And that's going to be equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. How much fluid was displaced when this object was submerged? A fluid of the same volume times the density of the fluid, right? That should give me the mass that was um, uh, displaced. And then I do m times g, I get the weight of the fluid displaced. So if I immerse this object, we saw from pressure that forces perpendicular to the surface act at every point, yeah? Compressive forces. And you can see the one from the east and the west are canceling out, they're exactly equal and opposite. What about the ones from the north and the south? Would we expect them to cancel out? Oh, they don't look like they're canceling out. The north one is much smaller and the southern force, yeah? Why is that? That's because the pressure at this level is much lower than the pressure due to the fluid at this level, yeah? Remember, at this level, we have all this rho GH to be added. Hence, there's a net upward force due to this difference, yeah? Here, they cancel out because they're at the same height. But these are completely different heights. So we have pressure due to the fluid in between. And that pressure difference gives rise to the buoyant force, which is this minus this. That will be the net buoyant force. So if we write that buoyant force as B, it's equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. This is M times G of the fluid. Okay, let's just write that. Oops, sorry. This is equal to, sorry. This is equal to M times G for the fluid. I'll just write F for fluid. And the mass of the fluid is nothing but the density times the volume, yeah? From the density definition. So that's what's been substituted in here. So the buoyant force becomes rho fluid, V fluid times G. And now you understand where it came from. Okay. Whether an object sinks or floats depends on the relationship between the buoyant force and the weight of the object. So the buoyant force is upward, the weight of the object is downward. If the weight is greater, the object is going to sink. If the buoyant force is greater, the object is going to go upwards, begin to float. Yeah. So we have buoyant force minus the weight. We saw the buoyant force was rho Vg, yeah? And the weight is m times g for the solid or for the object. m times g is the same volume, yeah? So we have rho object times Vg. So we have just a difference in fluid, density, in fluid and object densities times some constants because the volume is constant for the object. So you can see that depending on which one of these is greater, it's either going to sink or to rise. Here's my object, has certain volume. Here's the buoyant force, here's the weight mg. Here's the same expression again. And if rho fluid is greater than rho object, then we're going to have a net upward or positive force. And so the direction of my net force is going to be the same direction as my acceleration. The object is going to accelerate upwards, which means when my density of solid is less than the density of the fluid that it's immersed in, the object will float, which is our common everyday experience. Yeah? And when you have an object whose density is greater than the fluid density, Exactly the reverse will happen. We'll have now rho object is greater than rho fluid, so we get a negative net force, which means it's downwards. So the object sinks. 
Okay.